Okay, welcome to this video lecture series on basic surveying. And today we are in module 11. It's a new module which we are starting today, and this is about project survey. Today we will start with lecture number one in that. This is the overall program of our entire video series lectures. What we will cover in the project survey is written over here. This is in lecture number one, lecture number two, and lecture number three. So first of all, we will be talking about the concept of setting out. Why we need to set out? We will see one example. Then we will see the use of control stations in setting out. And what are the basic procedures for setting out? Later on, we will see the error sources and what precautions we need to take. And finally, what is the tolerance level, you know, permissible error, which is there and how to take into account that thing. In addition to this, in our next two lectures, we will be talking about some particular projects. For example, in the second lecture, we will talk about the curve. If there is a curve and we want to set out the curve in the field, what is the procedure for that? Then later on, we will be talking about the road and the building, how to set out those in the field. Well, to start with, why we need to set out? That is the basic question, you know, why we need to set out? Before we get into that, what we will try to do, we will try to see a typical life cycle of a project at initial stages. When I say project, I mean any civil engineering project. Okay, it may be a bridge, it may be a building, it may be a road, it may be a dam, any civil engineering project, what is the life cycle in initial stages? So we will see that by one example. The example here is, we want to have a road and a bridge in the area. Well, over here in the screen, I am showing you the ground. This is ground. So right now we are seeing the ground and the ground is very large here. For example, let's say this entire length is of order of 2 kilometer and as well as the width is around 750 meter. So it's a huge area. What is desired here is starting from a point A, we want to go to point B while there are jungles in that area as well as some habitation. So this red is the symbol for habitation and these are the symbols for jungles. And rest of the area is you know barren fields. While this particular feature here is a water body. Well, we want to have a road and a bridge which will join these two places. Or for example, even in road and bridge, we have some questions which we are going to raise now. So if this is the project, we want to join these two places, A and B, what should we do? You know, you just think yourself, you know, you are start standing on that ground. Right now, I have brought that ground onto my video screen, on your television screen. But think that you are standing on that ground. And while you are standing, you want to have a road between two points, A and B, which are around 2.5 kilometers apart. Now, how to do that? Should we start from one village and start going to the other? No, that's not the way. We have discussed the principle of surveying also, which is very important principle in anything. We say whole to part. First, we should know about the whole thing. We should do the recognizance. We should come out with the best possible project. Well, how can we do that? In order to come out with the best possible route between these two points, what should we do? We should be able to do something so that we can see the area synoptically. You know, the entire area in one go. We can see all the features which are there in the area, all the landforms, all the obstructions, all the habitations, all the forest types, all the quarry sites. We should be able to see them, assess them, and then accordingly we will decide about a route. Now, how do we do that? Obviously, we know that we would like to make a map. So, we would like to map this area. That particular entire area, we would like to make a map of that. Okay. Now, we want to make a map of this area. Now, in order to make a map of this area, as you can see, we will have to decide about one technique. 
what is the technique that we are going to use for making a map? We will have to decide about the instruments. Okay, less about the techniques. In techniques, if you observe this area, and we have decided that we are going for triangulation. So, first of all, as you know, we would like to do the reconnaissance in order to locate those points which can serve as the triangulation stations. And there are some requirements we know. Once we are talking about the triangulation, we discussed what are the points which we should keep in mind in order to locate the triangulation stations or the survey stations. Well, keeping those points in mind, let us say we decide that these are the locations. You can see these locations here now in blue. So, these are the triangulation stations. Well, if these are the triangulation stations, what we will do? We know the procedure of triangulation. We will measure the angles, all the angles which are possible there. We will measure one length out of all these lengths, which is possible to be measured easily. So, over here, what we are doing right now, we are forming the triangulation. Right here, we are assuming that the intervisibility is possible. That is why we have taken the line of sight through Zangal. Similarly, here also. So, that is our triangulation network. One of the lines, for example, this line can be measured easily. So, I am drawing this line now. I am rather highlighting this line. So, that is our baseline. And then we measure rest of the angles. All the angles are measured. So, we know now the triangulation can be done. And we can compute the coordinates of all the points which form our triangulation network. Well, having done the triangulation, what is the next step? Triangulation means we are collecting the skeleton of the area. So, in our drawing sheet now, where we are going to make the map, our skeleton is plotted because we know the control points. Then rest, we plot the details. We have seen the details can be plotted by plane tabling or maybe in this case, let us say, we are doing the plane tabling or intersection by the theodolite or maybe by taking the offsets. So, whatever the method, we are plotting the details. So, by this method, we generate the map. So, here it is map of area and other details, you know the graphical scale, the scale written as RF, representative fraction, the details who prepared it and as well as the legend and other thing. This is plotted in the map. Well, we have the map. What next? The map gives you a facility to look at your area in a synoptic way. The entire area, all the habitations, all the forest, everything is possible that you can see in one go. So, maps, they make it possible to plan your project. Well, so after completing this step number one in the life cycle of a project, which was surveying, I am saying here making the map or we can say surveying in general. So, we are doing the surveying as the first step. The second step is on the survey thing, we are doing the project planning. So, this is the second step. So, what is the meaning of that? Well, project planning means on this map, now it is map and I can work on this map. I can come out with various routes. For example, I decide to choose a route like this in order to join to these two points. Well, someone else, he says, no, this route is not good. Rather, we should go for some other route and he chooses a route like this, where there in between will be a bridge. And someone says, no, even he wants to take a different route because of some reason. The reasons may be different and his route is maybe something like this and the bridge is here. So, while we are doing the planning using the map, it is possible that we can come out with various routes and then we go for the optimum one or the optimal or the best one, the best route which is possible under the circumstances. Okay, if that decision is taken and we say, well, this is the best possible route, so other routes are not taken into account. So, this route along with the bridge is marked on our map. What is the next step? Now, the route means the road and the bridge, they are on the map. What we should do next? 
the third step the third step in life cycle of the project is transferring the project onto the ground so the road and the bridge which are there on the map sheet or because i am giving the map sheet as an example it may be you know in our computer also because we can do the planning on computer our map is staying in the computer so from that planning stage we want to take that project onto the ground now how to do that that's the question and this procedure of taking the project from map sheet or from our drawing board to the ground is called setting out well how do we do setting out now in this case if i go to the ground let's say we visit the ground now we have a map sheet with us and on that map sheet we have the road and, and as well as the bridge location plotted now we are visiting the ground if we visit the ground still there on the ground there is nothing you know the ground will look like as i am showing you here the ground will have only our control stations which we had marked earlier and these control stations when we fix these we fix them in such a way that they will stay there for longer periods so after two months of surveying when we visited this area still the control stations are there so we have the control stations and as well as the other detail the rest of the ground and what we have to do now i have to see that how my road and my bridge will come and where exactly will it come we do not know right now whether it will be what whether it is here whether it is here whether it is here and that is a question there on my map its location is only one location as you can see in the map so what we need to do now this is important the way the project has been planned on my drawing board on my drawing sheet on my map sheet we need to transfer it in exact details onto the ground so we need to transfer the project exactly onto the ground as it had been planned exactly means you know it's the relationship of the project with the landscape the geometric integrity of the project that should be also transferred onto the ground so the project the way it has been designed in a relative sense in itself the project itself as well as the project the way it has been laid out on the map sheet in relation to the landscape that has to be transferred onto the ground exactly so this is the procedure of setting out now how to do that so over here in the ground as we discussed we only have our control points so what we would like to do we would like to make use of these control points which are also there in the map so what we will do here they are on the map with respect to these control points we will try to find where our project is for example if there are some points on my line let us say the road which was planned is that's the road which was planned finally along with the bridge and we want to now locate some of the points of the roads there on the ground so what can i do over here let's say in order to locate this particular point i can measure its angle and as well as this angle so two angles alpha and beta if they can be measured on the drawing sheet with respect to station a and b so what i can do i can go to the field set up this line by having the ranging rods here and putting the theod light over here i can measure the angle as where they you know alpha and beta angles because we had alpha and beta angles so same what we'll do we'll set out alpha angle and beta angle there in the field and wherever they intersect that's the point which is located now so what we ensured here we ensured that the point has been located where it should be as it was there in the map similarly any other point a point for example here on the road this point can be also located using some other 
control points. I am just making use of two angles, alpha 1, sorry, alpha dash and beta dash. So, a point here can be located by, if you go to the same set of stations. So, from these two, alpha dash and beta dash. So, this point is also located. Similarly, we can locate various points of a project along with the bridge and the entire project will be located there on the ground. So, what did we do? We made use of the control points. This is important. What we did? We went to the ground. We had the control points already there. We made use of the control points in order to find the coordinates of the project on the map sheet as well as then transferring those with respect to the control points which are there on the ground. So, by doing that, we are able to set out the project there on the field. So, in this, what we observe, our observations are, well, we of course, setting out is a very important activity. And for setting out, we need a network of 3D control stations. This is required. Then, how about the setting out method? I just discussed one case where we were measuring two angles alpha and beta to locate the point of intersection and these two angles alpha and beta were same as these were in the map. Not always this is possible. So, sometimes we have to go for some other method also. So, the method which we will use in the field will depend upon the field conditions and the project requirement. Each project will have a different requirement. Whatever we are going to set out will have a different requirement. Our method will depend upon that only. Well, what we will do now? We will talk about the various things which come in this procedure of setting out. We will start with control stations. What is the role of control stations? We know it. Control stations means they are established in the field as well as in the map. They help in making the map as well as they help later on in finding the relative position of project on the map sheet and then we take that relative position to the ground. So, control points are very important. We know about that. Next, it is important, you know, because from the duration, you know, the duration between the very first survey in the field when we are making the map, from that point to the point when we are actually transferring the project onto the ground could be a long duration many times. It might take, you know, one year when we did the survey and later on when we actually transferred the project onto the ground. The planning stage, the design stage took around eight or nine months. It is possible or sometime it may be less also. But in any case, whether it is more or less, whatever, we need those control points there on the ground. Those control points which we used for surveying should stay there because they help in the process of setting out. Now, in order to ensure that they are there, we need to protect them. How to protect them? There are various methods. For example, you can make very big concrete blocks and insert them into the ground. You know, like the stations, we discussed some, when we were talking about the triangulation, we discussed what is the, you know, the standard method of making a station. Make proper stations which are embedded there on the ground. So, they will stay there. In addition, sometimes it is possible, you know, if you are working in a very BG construction site, it may be possible that one of the stations may get damaged. Some excavation is going on there. So, that station may be damaged. So, what we need to do? We need to protect our stations properly. There could be way, varieties of methods of protecting it. Just one example here. One, one example here is, this is a concrete block which is embedded there on the ground. And as well as, what we have done, we have protected this station by these wooden planks. And as well as, we have written over here about this station. Well, what is the RL of this? What is the chains of this? And something like that. So, the method may vary, but the important thing is we should protect this station. 
not only protection many times you know even if we have protected this protected the station but it is possible that in that beach site someone came with heavy digger and he dug that entire area so that station has gone away that was a very important station but it has been dug out now it is no more there so in this kind of situation what we need to do we need to go for referencing of station also so not only we establish the control stations in the field rather we also take their references now what is the meaning of references even if the station is not there we should be able to locate the station how can we do that when we are establishing a station for example here over here a station is established this is a concrete block and this concrete block is embedded there on the ground and when this con concrete block was established that's the point of the station along with this we establish some more stations or other the some more concrete blocks what they serve if i stretch some thread between these two points it intersects exactly over the station so even if this station is damaged this station is damaged by using these a b c and d stations it is possible that we can locate its location further so over here this is our survey pack survey pack means our survey station while these are our referencing packs referencing pack means which we are using for the referencing many times if there is a survey station we would like to reference it with respect to some permanent objects let us say there are one electric pole and two buildings and i measure the distance of my station from these three so these distances are known so by using these also we have generated some references and even if this station is damaged later on it is possible that because we know the distance we can further locate it after some time so this is why we need to generate these references now we will go for the basic procedures which we need to follow in setting out so basic setting out procedures we'll talk about these one by one in detail but overall overall what we can say the plans or our maps are always on a plane coordinate system you know if we have a map a map has a coordinate system with it always we can assume you know, x and y that's the coordinate system along with the map now on that map we have designed a particular building for example this is the building let us say so salient points of design are also in the same system well salient points means those points which i can make use of in order to locate this building so these are the salient points for example so these points point number 1 2 3 i can find their coordinates x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 also in the same system now once we have this information we use this information for setting out now this setting out is done basically by two methods one we say polar coordinate method and intersection method and you know we are not limited always to these methods this is important what i am giving you here is only you know only just idea about some methods but actually when you work in the project actually when you are working in the field you have to come out with a method which may have a bearing on these concepts so these methods or these terms or these procedures which we are discussing here are only the conceptual things there in the field when we are working in the field we have to base our final solution on these concepts but our final solution may be entirely different so what we'll do now we'll talk about these methods one by one well we start with this polar coordinate method now what is the polar coordinate method in polar coordinate method if we have the controls a 
B and C and here we had the map. On that map A, B and C are there. There on the map there was a building corner. Let us say this is the building corner. B and this building corner needs to be established there on the ground. So what we can do, I can have a reference line and from this reference line I can observe the angle, I can measure this angle alpha and also I can measure the distance L. So this is the polar coordinate system over here and what I do now in the field, I go to that reference line BA and from that reference line we will set out angle equal to alpha and then on that length alpha we will set out the distance L. Of course, this L will be multiplied by the scale because we are working in the field, the scale of the map. So, this is the point D and this is the first corner of our building which has been set out now. So, this is the method which we say polar coordinate method. What we observe here in this case, we had to set out angle and as well as length. So, the question comes now, how to set out angle and how to set out the length? What should we do? What are the methods for this? Okay, we are going to now discuss about the setting out of angle. I give you one example. Let us say the angle to be set is 43 degrees, 26 minutes and 40 seconds. And we have a vernier theodolite which has a least count of 20 seconds. How to set out this angle? Well, if you remember, when we discussed the one-year theodolite, in case of the one-year theodolite, there were two scales. The main scale, which was there in the bottom, and the one-year scale. In one year, we had one-year A and one-year B, and that's the main scale, which is graduated from 0 to 360. When we rotate this one year, along with this one year, the telescope also rotates and the angle value changes. Now, the one year is used to read in fractions of, or rather, in, with the least count of 20 seconds. Okay? In the main scale, if you remember, in the main scale, we can read up to 20 minutes. The least count of the main scale is 20 minutes. So keep that in mind, the least count of main scale is 20 minute, least count of one year scale is 20 second and this is the angle which we need to set out. So the procedure for this is, first of all, in our one year, we look through the eyepiece and in our one year, we will set out an angle of 6 minutes and 40 seconds. So, this is the angle which is set out in the one year. Initially, for example, in this problem itself, initially when we are looking in this direction, the reading is 0, 0, 0. That's the reading. And now, we set out in our one year, 6 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, what we do next, rest angle, that is 43 degrees, and 20 minutes. This we change or this we read or rather we rotate now our telescope because already the 6 minutes and 40 seconds angle is already rotated. So now we rotate our telescope so that the angle on the main scale is 43 and 20. So the total angle that will be set out is 43, 26 and 40 seconds. Now this is an you know, not very difficult thing to do, but there may be a rather little difficult situation when the angle that we have to set out is not in multiples of least count. Over here, the angle is 43 degree, 26 minutes and 43 seconds. When it was 40 seconds, it was fine because the least count of one year is 
20 seconds. But now it is 43. We cannot set out 3 seconds with this instrument because its least count is 20 seconds. So, what we do? Well, that is our reference line. From this reference line, first we set out the angle as we just discussed, which is 43 degree, 26 minutes and 40 seconds. That is the angle which we set out and it is possible to set out this angle. Next, what we do? We again observe this angle by repetition method. Though we have set it out, but naturally there will be some error. So, what we do? We observe this angle again by repetition method and let us say by repetition method this angle comes out to be 26 and 41 seconds. It is possible. Though we have set out 40, but it is possible that by repetition method the exact angle which is there is 41. Okay? So, this is angle, this is angle 43, 26, 41. So, our angle alpha here is less by 2 seconds from our desired angle. So, what should we do? Because we cannot set out 2 seconds. Well, for this length, if I draw a perpendicular here and I know this length d, we can compute what should be this distance d small d because we know this angle is 2 seconds. So, if it is so, I can compute the distance d and what we can do, we can set out the angle now in such a way that our actual angle becomes the angle between this line and after setting out this distance, we get a point and we get this line. So, our actual angle which we wanted to set out is this angle. Again, if you want to be more accurate, we can further measure this angle by repetition method. In order to know whether it is within the permissible limit or not. Well, in case of total station, what will happen? Total station does provide more facility of reading and setting out the angles automatically. So, if the angle is in multiple of least count, we can set the angle in the total station and the total station will automatically take that much rotation. So, we can set out the angles that way in the case of the total station. However, here also, if the angle to be set out is smaller or rather, I should not say smaller, rather the precision of the angle is not or rather the angle is not the multiple of the least count. The better way of saying it, the angle that we, are, we want to set is not multiple of the least count. The least count is, for example, 5 seconds for a total station, but the angle that is to be set out is 43, 26 and 27. That is the angle which is to be set out. So, we have to set, do something in order to set out this extra 2 seconds. So, what we will do again, we will go by this particular method and that particular angle can be set out. So, this is about the angles. Okay, now we will see how can we set out the distances because if in a map you are setting out this building corner which is D with reference to A, B and C control points and how we are doing it? We are doing it by polar coordinate method where we are observing this angle alpha and this distance L. So, this distance which we have to set out is 100.23 meter. Now, here on the ground, let us draw the ground here now. Well, there on the ground, this is A and B and C are there. Okay, this is the point where the B is and we have already set out our angle alpha. So, the alpha angle is somewhere in this direction. Now, what we need to do? We need to fix a point here somewhere. We do not know where so that the distance B D is 100.23. Now, how to do it? If we have a tape of 30 meter length. 
Now with the tape of 30 meter length, setting out this distance, what we can do, I can observe 30 meter, 30 meter, 30 meter, and then I can stretch the tape, and further I can measure the rest of the distance, that is 10.23. So 30 meter plus 30 meter plus 30 meter plus 10.23. Because I cannot set out this full distance in one go. I have to do it in these little parts. Well, the better method of doing is, how we do it actually, the better way of doing this, we can make a guess. Well, my distance, my point D should be somewhere between these two points. And we say, let us say these two points are X and Y. Our point D should be somewhere in between these two points. This is, you know, we are making a guess. And a server has to be always good in making these guesses. It is, these are required in the field. After making this guess, what we do, major, we measure the distance BY and BX. Let us see the BY distance is 99.03 meter. And the BX distance is also measured and it is 104.15 meter. These are the distances which are measured. So what we can do now, because when we are using the tape, chain, in any case we have to apply the corrections also. So we can apply now our correction in this entire length BY as well as in this entire length BX and we can have their corrected value. Okay, what is the corrected value of this length as well as of this length? Once we have done this, I know the length up to this is a certain value. So, my problem is reduced now to set out only a little distance which is 100.23 minus 99.03 from the point Y. So, from the point Y, I will set out only a small distance. So, if at all there is any trial and error, all those problems, they are for a small distance and we can avoid also applying correction for that small distance. So, our rest of the distance has all the corrections properly applied and this distance is then finally measured. So, what we have done, a distance which was a large distance of 102.23 meter order has been now reduced to the measurement of a distance which is of 2, 3 or 5 meter, that kind of order. And because it is easier to do any trial and error, any putting of the tape, you know, all those things for a smaller distance than for a larger one. Now, in case of EDMI, generally there is a facility because we have seen the EDMI. In EDMI, I have got the EDMI or in my total station as the target moves. So, while the target is moving, the EDMI continuously shows us the distance. So, again here also we have to make a guess. Starting from a point, if we have to set out a distance, naturally what we would like to do, we would like to first observe this distance. Whatever is the distance, we would, we would not like to do the trial and error in this entire stretch. Rather, we will limit the trial and error for this. And once we have observed the distance, we know we need to move in this direction or in this direction. And then accordingly, the point will be fixed at the distance L as desired. Okay, another procedure of setting out because the first method which we discussed was by polar coordinate and the second method which we discussed is now by intersection. Now, in the case of the intersection, what we are doing, if we have two theodolites. Okay. Well, again, that's our map. In the map, the point D and these are our control points A, B and C. Let us say that's the baseline which we choose and from this baseline, we find the angles for this point. So, what we are doing now, intersection means we are setting out by two angles, not by one angle and one distance. Rather, we are setting out by alpha and beta. 
alpha and beta. So, this is why this we say this as method of intersection. Now, if we have two theodolites available in the field, this becomes a very straightforward process A, B, C. We keep our theodolite at A and at B both and then at A we set out from B A an angle equal to alpha. So, this angle is set out as alpha and now this theodolite is looking in this direction. While at B we set out the angle beta from line B A and we are looking in this direction. Now, someone here moves with a ranging rod and the moment this ranging rod is bisected by both of these those lights or the line of sight is there because someone is looking from these two third lights and once this ranging rod is bisected by both of them so that's the point which is the point of intersection or our point d which we wanted to set out so this is the method of if we have the two third lights well if we have only one third light then in that case what to do in that case, let us say again this is A, B and C, our control stations and we want to set out a D which is somewhere in this area. This is what we want to do. Well, from A, let us say we have only one set theory light. So, first what we will do from A, we will set out the angle alpha. So, the alpha angle is set out and this is line of sight. Now, in this line of sight again we can make a guess that my D point is somewhere in between this point and this point. So, what we do we put two packs here and then on top of these two packs we have a thread stressed. So, over here we have a thread stressed. If I show this thread by red color this is the thread which is stressed and here also let us say between these two points this is the thread I am showing this in plan here ok. Then we move our theodolite to second station and from there we set out the angle beta. So, after setting out this angle beta that is the line of sight. So, where this line of sight intersects the thread the corresponding point on the ground can be found. So, this is the line of sight and this is the point D. So, that is the point D which can be located now on the ground. So, basically what we are seeing here, you know depending the field condition, depending the availability of the instrument, we have to change our method. Next, one more approach we will see and this is the approach which say in which you are making use of the grids. We will see the concept of the grid and how we can make use of the grids. And these grids are suitable for structures which are having gridded pattern. You know, maybe a building which has a gridded pattern, which can be set out easily by the making by making use of the grids. Because this appears as if there is a gridded pattern here in the building or its walls or the structural elements of the building. We have two types of the grids which are used for setting out. These are survey grid and site grid. Now, what these are and how do we make use of this? Let us say again we have a ground here and on this ground a project is planned. So, naturally if the project is planned here, the project that is planned is we want to have a town over here, a town is to be set out. So, first of all the very first step is that we would like to make a map of this entire area. Okay, now, we have the map of the area ready with us and on this map we would like to plan our town. Let us say a decision has been taken so that the main roads of the area or the town are like this. This is how the town is being planned. and so on. Similarly, the other facilities in the town will be also planned here. Once this town has been planned, we would like to take this town there on the ground. 
So right now we are seeing how we can make use of survey grid. Survey grid means a grid which we can lay on the map and which is also parallel to the the main coordinate system of the map. For example, this is our map here. I can put a grid on my map sheet, a grid like this. So the grid which is parallel to the easting and northing. In case of this map, is the survey grid. Now, this particular project can be referenced with reference to the survey grid. And the various points of the project can be measured or can be located with reference to this survey grid. So, next in the field, what we do? First of all, the job will be to transfer the survey grid. Okay, the very first element of the survey grid. Let's say this line is X and Y. And first of all, we would like to establish this line X and Y there on the ground and then complete rest of the grid. So, there on the ground, the rest of the grid is being completed. Similarly, in this direction, so basically what we have done, the survey grid which was formed there on the map has been now transferred onto the ground. And when I say it has been transferred on the ground, the meaning is we have some po control points on the sides of these lines. We, we do not have any lines there on the ground because these lines are not possible putting lines like this on the, on the ground. Rather we have some stations and joining these stations, we can complete our grid. And similarly on this side, you can just think that as if the ranging rods are put on these points. So the survey grid has been laid now. Now our project, this is our project which we can map its offsets from the survey grid. For various important or the salient points in the design, in the project, we can find their locations with reference to the survey grid. So now we have to set out only these two little distances in the corresponding grid. So in the corresponding grid, I set out these two distances. So I have the point X or the point, let us say this is the point P on my design, on my road network and this point P is set out here. Similarly, any other point, for example, let us a, a point is here. And then this point is Q and it, this is in this particular grid. So by knowing these two offsets, this point can also be plotted here, Q. So similarly, we can set out the entire project in this area. So what we did, we made use of a grid which is parallel to the easting and northing directions as in the map. So this is why we say this as survey grid. Well, the second we would like to make use of now side grid. What is side grid? Well, the project which was planned here is this. This is the project which was planned. It was desired to have the road network like this and now we want to set it out. Let us say this is the project which has been planned. So what we can do instead of having a grid which is parallel to the easting and northing, we can have a grid which is parallel to the project because the project has some cardinal directions. For example, this direction. I have my x and y here and then I develop a grid system. parallel to the, because this is a grid pattern. So, 
Now we have a new grid system and this grid is the side grid. Side grid means a grid which follows the principal directions in the project. Because in my project these are the principal directions. So we have developed a grid on my map which follows the principal directions of the project. So now what we do next? These principal directions of the project we first transfer onto the ground. So, very first x and y which are here x and y these are transferred onto the ground and then we complete the grid. So, the grid is completed. Well, this project is also observed. Uh, you know, we can set out the various salient features of this project with respect to this grid and this is now easier and similarly by mapping these various offsets we can then set out our project here. So basically in this case the advantage of the side grid is because it follows the cardinal direction or the main you know principal directions of the project. So measurement of the distances it is becoming easier now because we are measuring in the direction of the project. So this is the other method of setting out a project. Mostly these methods, the grid methods will be used when the project is of gridded pattern. You know, I gave you one example of a road network. It could be an example of the building, a building which is gridded. Well, having seen this, now we would like to see some error, the error sources in setting out. The error sources are same, what we have been talking earlier also. The error could be natural. You know, when we discussed about the surveying, we talked about the various errors, errors which may occur because of the weather, which may occur because of the, you know, the, there is rainfall or the temperature is too low or too high. So, there are errors which are coming because of the nature. Then, second is personal, the person who is doing the setting out. He also influences the accuracy. Thirdly, the instrument. What instrument you are using? Is it adjusted? Is it levered? You are using a theodolite to observe the angle. But that is that theodolite properly set or the adjusted? And if you are observing the angle only in one phase, that's not right. We should observe or rather we should set out the angle using both the phases because we know the utility of both phase measurement. So, these are the things which we should keep in mind and always at every step we should keep applying the checks. We know the very first lecture or the second lecture we discuss about the principles of surveying. So, similarly here also we need to apply the checks and the redundancy. Finally, we would like to see always in a project, you know something which we observe from the drawing sheet. In our drawing sheet, in our drawing board, the project is planned or rather it is in the computer, you know, within the micro station, within the AutoCAD or any other system, the project has been planned there. I take a distance from there, 100.53, that is a true value which is coming from the drawing sheet, which is coming from the computer. And now I want to set that distance there on the ground. Well, I cannot set that distance exactly because that distance for example is 100.53 meter. Can I set exactly 100.53 meter? No, because while we are doing the setting out, we will introduce some errors. So always there is some tolerance. You know, when we are setting out, we should know what is the permissible error in this case. And depending the permissible error, if the permissible error is 2 millimeter at 1 sigma, then what we will do? We will, if we are taking the direct observation, you know, for example, we are measuring a distance using an EDMI. It is a direct observation. If you are doing a direct observation, we should go for an EDMI which supports this accuracy. If we are doing the indirect observation, indirect observation means in order to determine a length, we are measuring the various parts of it and then we are finally summing it up. 
So what is happening? The error here, the error here, the error here, the error here. All these errors, errors in, included here, they will finally propagate because our final distance L is sum of all these individual components. Okay, sum of all these distances. So there will be error in each component. So when we sum all these distances, the error will propagate and will be there finally in L. And we know if we have a case of indirect observation, how the error will propagate. We know this relationship. So there may be cases when we are doing setting out by indirect observations. So what all instruments we are using and what is the accuracy that these instruments can give? And then finally, how all these observations which we are carrying out are being utilized in the function. I am writing y is a function of f x i. What is this function? Then accordingly, the error will propagate. So we can do the computation. So by doing this computation, we will know whether we are working within the permissible limit or not. So this is important. So what we saw today, we saw the basic concepts of the setting out. One important thing, whatever we discuss here, some of the methods, they are just conceptual things. There in the field, the solution will be entirely different. But yes, these concepts are important. Thank you.